My name is John Lee, and I'm with the Small Business Development Center, which is right down the hallway over there. We don't have a sign on our door yet. We got a new doorway because with all the tile out there in the hallway, it gets pretty loud when there's a lot of But things at the university uh, all the other day run kind of slow sometimes when it comes to getting things done. So at some point, we will get that. But we, we help people get started in small business. We're basically a free management consulting service that can help you existing businesses or people that are trying to get started. Uh, and we'll walk you through the process, do everything we can to help you get going. Business plans, financial plans, all those types of things. Uh, we can help with all of that. Uh, there are some things that we don't do, uh, and that's why people like Craig Escamilla that will be talking to you later. It's more somebody that's hands-on with your business, in your business, finding out about it and doing that. That's a little beyond our purview. But we're here as an economic development organization to help small businesses get started and then stay in business. So I'd like to welcome you to the CICE building, the Center for Innovation, Commercialization, and Entrepreneurship. If you can say that and spell it correctly, you can get a degree. So, um, we are, the upstairs of this building is, is considered an incubator. Um, it's kind of been on hold for a little bit. We've got a new director coming in on Monday, and I hope that, that will help things really take off here and to start uh, giving some of these businesses a place where they can work with the university and use university resources to help them really get going. A lot of these new new ideas that uh, hopefully, you know, the next big thing. We have had some successes. We had a client that came in that took like about three years, but has now signed about $40 million worth of contracts with the U.S. government to provide some services in some of the military bases. So I mean, you can go from nothing to, to something, and hopefully we can help you do that. So uh, again, it's a free service available to anybody uh, you don't have to be a student or anything. We're here to service the local community. So if you need us, please contact us. And let me turn it over to Paul Kester. He's going to talk about the chamber and introduce our chamber. Thanks, John. So I uh, appreciate y'all being here. Like John, I'm a board member for the Beaumont Chamber and happy to see uh, a diverse group of people here, uh, new companies. Um, companies that have been around for a long period of time, uh, but with new ownership. Um, so it's really a, a heartfelt um, accomplishment to see, like I said, a large group of people here. So I've been tasked with uh, coming up and giving a few um, uh, tidbits about the Chamber and what the Chamber is all about for you as community members and businesses in the community. So one of the areas of focus that the Chamber is always working on, and I'll try not to spend too much time on this, is connecting. And I'm going to put my cheaters on here because I did print it a little smaller than I wanted. Uh, so the Chamber's goal and area of focus is connecting and we provide opportunities for the business community to connect and grow. And this is just one of those opportunities for you to connect and grow with other businesses and government agencies in the area. Uh, another area of focus is brand promise. And I didn't bring all of them, but these two really, I think, uh, set us a, a tone for this meeting. Uh, we believe that the health of the business community and the health of the entire community in which it exists are linked. Providing the tools that businesses need to succeed is central to the success of the community as a whole. And I think we all can agree to that here. Um, a few other things that I uh, am going to talk about is this Beaumont Business Academy series that Craig is uh, speaking on today for Strategic Planning 101. We have four other dates upcoming, so if you want to write these down or you can check the Chamber website, Tuesday, June 28th is our next event, uh, and it's professional and personal organization. Um, August 25th, we're going to have someone from Hancock Whitney come in and talk about fraud, uh, and companies nowadays need to concentrate on that. Um, there's other companies or other organizations that are specifically targeting companies for fraud. Uh, the next one is October 25th, and that's customer engagement, which I think is very important to everyone here. And December 1st is the last in the series is public speaking. So um, I want to um, ask you to um, uh, register for those if you would like to attend. 
Um, and one thing as new businesses, and I, I was talking in the back of the room to a gentleman, um, if you have a new company or an organization that you really want to get the word out, uh, one of the easiest and best ways and least expensive ways is we have a chamber uh, Friday morning business connection at the Elegante every Friday morning from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. If you don't attend it, you need to. It's probably um, probably one of the most fun, free events you'll, you'll have um, and, and have an experience. You get to see a lot of camaraderie, a lot of laughs, um, and get to introduce yourself, whether it's your company or a nonprofit organization. So, so that's my uh, little bit of, about the chamber. And then now I get the, the wonderful opportunity of introducing your guest speaker today. So uh, Craig Escamillo helps others work on rather than in their businesses. With 15 years of consulting, teaching, and senior management experience, Craig brings a wealth of practical experience to his consulting work. As an advisor, Craig helps small and medium-sized businesses with strategic plan development and implementation, succession planning, team management tools and systems, team communication, resolving conflicts in customer acquisition, and most importantly, retention. We all know that it's cheaper to retain a new customer than it is to get a new one. Uh, Craig also coaches clients and presents on strategy, business communication, improving meetings, productivity, leadership, and ethics. So a little bit personally about Craig, uh, prior to launching CAE Solutions, Craig practiced what he preaches at the Symphony in Southeast Texas and Lamar University. As an executive director of the symphony, Craig oversaw budget, ticket sales, and individual contribution increases. As music director, uh, or in the search for the new music director, and the elimination of all financial debt for the symphony of Southeast Texas, and that's, uh, that's something that's really an accomplishment. Craig served Lamar University as a management instructor and director of accreditation and assessment in the College of Business, and as the dire executive director of retention and student services. Public, Craig has published case studies and articles on strategic planning, leadership, ethical behavior, and nonprofit management, and has given speeches, presentations at the national and international conferences and to local civic organizations. Craig holds a, a bachelor's in music and a master's of business degree, and he was selected as one of 30 participants in the League of American Orchestras Essentials of Orchestra Management Seminar in 2008 was a 40 under 40 uh, participant in 2014. And during his undergraduate studies, he was selected as a McNair Scholar conducting research in musical improvisation. What, talk about saying something over and over again. Um, <laughs> can I get a degree for saying that? Um, Craig is actively involved in the Southeast Texas community, specifically with the Rotary Club and the Greater Beaumont Chamber of Commerce, where he also is chairing our search committee for our new Executive Director for the Chamber. So, if you would give a, a welcome to, a warm welcome to Craig Estimate. Thank you, Paul. Uh, a couple of comments. One is, Paul, even with the cheaters, you still look younger than me. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. That's right. Yes. And um, the musical improvisation thing. So I, I decided that that was a nicer way in a bio to say that actually what I studied as an undergraduate student and still study today is the uh, specific musical improvisation style of Elton John. So I'm a pianist and I'm very interested in how he just makes stuff up in concerts on the piano. So that was really what that was about. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, good, then I won't bother with all this stuff. I'm gonna get this to where I can kind of reach it from different angles, because I'm not really a podium kind of person. And so, we're gonna talk about strategic planning today. I'm gonna ask you to kind of play along, um, because I think you'll get more value out of it. So, we can't develop an entire strategic plan for your organization in an hour today, okay? And you'd be lucky if we did that in a year, okay? But um, we'll do our best. So if you could just kind of, to play along with me, select maybe one project, uh, you know, one sort of, multi-step, uh, multi-part thing that you're working on in your business or your organization. And if you'll kind of use that throughout today, I think you'll get some, some benefit out of that, okay? Be something that, that really has kind of some high-level implications that you can really kind of look at, at some things really up at the high level and then zoom into some more specific things. So try to get something in mind and, and work with me on there and we'll, we'll try to give you some time to actually take a break and work on those things. All right, so quick overview of what we'll be looking at today. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what a strategy is, what strategy even is, what strategic planning is, 
and then we'll go through a process for strategic planning so that you can kind of see that. We'll talk about mission and vision and values. Uh, we'll talk about situational analyses. We'll talk about goals and strategies. And then finally, how you uh, implement and evaluate your strategic plan, okay? Uh, so before we get too deep into this, let's just talk about what strategy is. And here's Dilbert. Love Dilbert. I'll just let you read at your own pace. All right, so <clears throat> fairly accurate statement there. All right, so what is strategy? Well, I like to start with a little bit of etymology for the Silsby folks in the audience. Uh, that means uh, the sort of roots of words. Um, I have a friend from Silsby in the audience. So I, <laughs> All right, my wife is from Silsby too, but I'm pretty sure she knew what etymology was before I did. So, uh, all right, so marry up, right? All right, so I always like to start with some etymology uh, because I think that we have a tendency in our business professions to throw words around, assuming that everybody's using them with the same meaning in mind, okay? So I think it's better if we all sort of are ensuring that we're on the same page about what things actually mean, where they came from, what the history is, and what impact that has on how we learn and apply knowledge, okay? So, bear with me for just a second, but I'll make this interesting and tie it together, I promise. All right, so strategy. So what, what is the, the sort of history and definitions of the word strategy? So I went back to good old Merriam-Webster, and there's a whole bunch of definitions. I'll share a couple with you. So there's 1A and 1B, and 1A is split into two parts, and 1A1 says the science and art of employing the political, economic, psychological, and military forces of a nation or group of nations to afford the maximum support to adopted policies in peace or war. What? All right. Let's try 1A2. The science and art of military command exercised to meet the enemy in combat under advantageous conditions. All right, this is getting a little better for us, right? How about 1B? A variety of or instance of the use of strategy. Not that helpful. How about 2A? A careful plan or method, or 2B, the art of devising or employing plans toward a goal. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so what do we have here? We have the science and art of meeting the enemy in combat under advantageous conditions with a careful plan or method and the art of devising or employing plans toward a goal. First use of the word strategy, 1779. But of course, the ancient Greeks used what we would probably pronounce as strategos, and then of course ancient Asia, 5th century BC, the art of war, right? All about strategy. All right, so what have we learned here? The origin is military or battle, meaning competition. Strategy in business is a set of actions aimed at creating a competitive advantage to, the, to position the business for success or to win. Successful business strategies can be internal, competing with yourself to be a better version, or external, competing with other businesses for increased market share. All right, what about strategic? Let's do the same thing. Oh, I forgot to advance the slide. I gotta pay attention to my own notes, sorry. All right, strategic, or strategery if you're a Saturday Night Live fan from about 20 years ago. All right, so strategic, two definitions of, relating to, or marked by strategy. Okay, not really all that helpful, right? Or 2C, so again, there are others, but taking definition 2C from Merriam-Webster, of great importance within an integrated whole or to a planned effect. Okay. First use of the word strategic, 1799, so just a very short period after time, of time after strategy entered the lexicon. And then the last one is plan. So two forms of plan, we have noun and verb form. Let's talk about the noun form, highlighting a few definitions. 2A, a method for achieving an end. 2B, an often customary method of doing something. 2C, a detailed formulation of a program of action. 3, an orderly arrangement of parts of an overall design or objective. 4, a detailed program. And then on the verb side, to arrange the parts of, to devise or project the realization or achievement of, or to have in mind. 
First use, the noun form, 1735, the verb form, 1718. So about 50 years or so before strategy really entered the lexicon in its current form. So uh, in order to have an effective strategy, we have to document how to achieve a goal and follow that documented process, meaning a plan. Why spend so much time on this? Let me ask you a question. What was happening in the world in the late 1700s, early 1800s? War between France and Great Britain and the French Revolution. Okay. The ending of the American Revolution, okay. uh, then the beginnings of the Industrial Age. So we have a lot of conflict, military conflict around the world, and we have the Industrial Revolution, right? So what is the Industrial Revolution? What is that? The Industrial Revolution increased manufacturing, right? Increased competition in business, increased consumerism, increased consumer choice, less localism, increasing regionalism and globalism in your buying options. What does that mean? Want to make money? Want to make more than others? You got to have a strategy. So what happens? Ancient military terminology comes into everyday vocabulary. We have a combat influence on emerging businesses that realize to win, you have to have a goal and a plan. In military, to win in business, that's probably true as well. And we have the birth of strategic planning. So that's why I wasted a bunch of time on that, quote, wasted, right? Because it's really important for us to understand where this came from. We spend a lot of time saying, oh, let's make a strategic plan. We've got to make a three-year plan, a five-year plan, whatever, right? And we put those things in binders, and we have board retreats and all that stuff. We bring all the people together in the big meetings with the whiteboards and the easels and all that, and then we file the binder away on a shelf for about four and a half years, and then somebody goes, we probably ought to do something about that plan, right? Yeah. And what we're learning here from the origin and the history is that it's something that you're constantly living, sharpening, refining, right? And thinking about how can I be better? How can I be faster? How can I be smarter? How can I pay attention to what everybody else is doing and learn from and build on, right? That's what strategic planning is. So what is strategic planning? Uh, here's a simple definition from the Corporate Finance Institute. Strategic planning is the art of creating biz specific business strategies, implementing them, and evaluating the results of executing the plan in regards to a company's overall long-term goals or desires. Okay, so let's recap that. Let me read it again. Strategic planning is the art of creating specific business strategies, implementing them, and evaluating the results of executing the plan in regard to the company's overall long-term goals or desires. So now you get to play along. What then does a strategic plan need? What are the components that that definition just gave us of a strategic plan? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to read it again. Strategic planning is the art of creating specific business strategies, implementing them, and evaluating the results of executing the plan in regard to a company's overall long-term goals or desires. So what do we need? What are the components? It's all there in the definition. First is the goals. Mm -hmm. Where are we going? Thank this you. Is where we're at. Where are we going? Thank you for noticing the importance of the order because it's the last thing in the definition, but it's the first and most important thing, right? What is the goal? What else do we need? Specific business strategies, right? We need to implement them, and then we need to evaluate them. Strategic planning is the art of creating specific business strategies, implementing them, and evaluating the results in regards to the company's overall long-term goals or desires. So there it all is, right? All right? Okay, so if you leave any of these out, what happens? The plan falls apart. Or if you're lucky, it succeeds in spite of itself. But we don't want luck, right? Okay. I mean, we want luck. We want to be able to take advantage of luck. All right? All right. So why? Why bother? Why develop a plan? Why document it? Why stick with it? Why? Why? You're all in a Chick-fil-A coma. <laughs> because, everybody, because you need to let the organization, everybody within the organization know this is where we're at and this is where we're going. Fantastic. So we need to communicate and coordinate activity. For the fair way to summarize 
the intent of what you meant? Uh, well, I don't know about that, but thank you. All right, what else? Ah, oh, we need accountability. Ooh, I like that word. We've been talking about that word today, haven't we, Josh? Okay, good. Not because of Josh. I feel like I keep setting this up in a way that makes it sound like... Sorry. Sorry. Josh is very good at, at accountability. All right, what else? Why do we need plans that are documented that we stick with? So we buy in from all the participants. Ah, okay, good. So we not only need coordination and communication, we need them to actually get it and want to do it. Good. So we can set milestones to know whether we're succeeding or not. So we can track progress and know if we're on track or not. Y'all are so good. All right. Fantastic. Good. So let's talk about a few of these because you got probably most of them here. So it aligns specific strategies and actions with overall goals. Remember, right? We're aligning specific strategies with the overall goals. We start with overall company goals, then we get into specific strategies. It focuses people's work. It tells them what to do, right? Coordinates the activity, gets buy-in, great. Captures the forest and the trees. In one document, you get both the macro goal picture and the micro strategy action step picture. One document can give us all that, right? That's why I love this stuff. It externalizes goals and action ideas. So let's talk about externalization in the human brain for just a second, right? Yeah, because this is good stuff. So the human brain is a, is a, a excellent servant but a terrible master and we use our brains all wrong all day long every day right because what we do is we keep all kinds of ideas and try to organize them and make decisions off of them all up here right but the brain's not good at that it's good at generating ideas and then making decisions off of the stuff that it generates right so when we externalize the list of all the ideas guess what then we can use whatever we need in terms of intuition to make a decision of what the best thing off that list to do is right this is why we have to-do lists right most people still have a lot of thinking to do about their to-do lists. Most people still have a lot of thinking to do about their strategic plans, which are just their organization's to-do lists. So externalizing is a big improvement opportunity for a lot of professionals. Another thing that strategic plans do for us is they identify the decision criteria for new business opportunities. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, right? Just like your personal to-do list is not really, its value is not so much in doing everything on it, but rather in having criteria to evaluate new opportunities, same thing is true for your business with its strategic plan. And then one of the last things, this is not an exclusive list of course, is that it creates organizational and team accountability measures. Couldn't have said it any better. Now, if you don't care about those outcomes, then strategic planning is not for you. Running a successful business is probably not for you either, okay? All right, so. Let's go through a process because it is a process, okay? So you're going to get a little glimpse here. If I sat down with you in your business, this is exactly the process I would take you through. Is this the be-all, end-all process? No. Is this the Craig customized process? No, not really. It's just a simple process that is one approach to developing a strategic plan, okay? So play along with me and here we go. I'm going to give you tips. I'm going to give you tricks. I'm going to give you tools. Um, this can be for you personally. You can make a strategic plan for yourself personally and your growth, your career, or it can be for your business, okay? All right, so here we go. So the first thing that we're always going to start with is the mission, okay? Always begin with the mission statement. Mission statements should tell us two and only two things, who we are and what we do. This is not the place for aspiration. This is not the place for how. This is not the place for wordy details. Yes, I've done mission statements with faculty members. Ugh. They're more like mission books. <laughs> All right, a concise definition of two things, who we are and what we do. So let's play. All right, so take a second. Who are you, what do you do? In your business or for you yourself? Give you about a minute. Make some notes. Play along, you get more out of it, I promise. Promise. You get very little out of me talking. You get a lot out of playing along.
All right, so who we are and what we do. My mission statement at my business, answering those two questions, who we are, well, it's mostly just me, but who we are <laughs> is I am absolutely, fanatically, weirdly, nerdly, strangely obsessed with the intersection of human behavior and how we make decisions and the impact of that on decisions. Okay? What do I do? I help people work on their businesses by analyzing how those things are happening within their businesses. There it is. That's not exactly what the mission statement says. It's actually much shorter than that. But I wanted to answer the two questions for you, right? All right, good. So, mission. Next thing we're going to look at then is values or principles. How we do what we do. How we are who we are. So, companies, people, we don't think much about our values, right? They, they're just, they become kind of part of us. They're usually a lot of times set at a very young age and then they just become part of us. But we think within them, right? They become lenses through which we view the world, through which we make decisions, through which we interact with people. And so I'm suggesting simply that you document and promote the values that you want your people to live within because that's how they're going to do all the rest of the stuff that they do. And if that's not documented, if, if it's just sort of free reign, then people are going to use their own set of values to make those decisions, right? Now, if it's just me, well, then it's just me, right? But if you got a whole team of people, that's a whole different conversation, right? You don't want 50 sets of values making decisions about how to do your work. You want one or part of one. I mentioned also, real quick, for those that own businesses where you need to communicate these things to internal and external parties, which is everybody that owns a business, right? Um, real versus stated values, okay? So think, think of this like a Venn diagram, right? You know the Venn diagrams with the two circles, right? Okay, so if you have a circle of stated values, those are the things that I'm saying document, right? These are our values. These are our core values, our principles, the way we operate, those kinds of things, right? But then we all have what happens in practice, how we actually do things, right? If those two circles are like over here, that's not good, okay? <laughs> you want as much overlap as possible. 100% is probably unlikely because, again, once you start introducing a bunch of people with their own value sets, you're going to get some variation there, okay? But uh, as close as possible, as close as possible, real versus stated values, big improvement opportunity. By the way, big improvement opportunity for a lot of major corporations if you want to go real big. All right, vision is our third component here. Now, I could go on and on about vision all day um, because it's just so incredibly important to business success and it's so underrated in terms of the buy-in and the motivation of people. It's, it's such a big, big, big piece of this, but people just don't like to sit and dream, which I don't understand because it's actually a lot more fun than anything else that any of us have to do, right? Um, and so, anyway, I could go on this all day. But suffice it to say, this is where you get to dream and document what you would like to hope to be true for the business. So this is the aspirational piece. This is the how piece, right? Uh, this is the what you hope to do. So our minds work in interesting ways, right? This is a, another interesting thing about the human brain and human behavior here. So if we give the mind a concrete image of wild success, it's pretty good at implementing a continuous improvement process that just removes everything that doesn't match that picture. Right? Golf, this always works well with golfers. Golfers in here? Who's, who are my golfers? Okay, all right, they're, they're concentrated over here, people. All right, if you play another sport, it works just fine. It works well with sports, right? But it particularly works well with golf, okay? So golf, when you're on the tee, when you're on the tee box, right, you have swing thoughts. Golfers have swing thoughts, right? And the swing thoughts are, are quite frankly, often some version of, Damn, this is that hole where I always go, you know, way out to the right in the woods, and then when I try to get back on the fairway, I end up in the water, and then there's sand up by the green, and this, right? This is what's going through your head. This is not real motivational stuff, right? You can use, then, the power of imagery and vision by changing those swing thoughts when you're on the tee. Oh, well, this is that hole. But today, what I'm going to do is this. Your game will improve dramatically, right? Vision. This is huge. This is big stuff. Big stuff. Really, really. So, you get this, right? Elite athletes know this, right? They understand that imagery and clarity of vision is a huge motivational tool for their, for their performance. Successful businesses get that it's a really important tool for their people also. So, when you document your vision, I suggest describing it in terms of wild success. So, what are your desired outcomes and what do you want wild success to be like, right? And do it in as much detail as possible, right? 
Don't, 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 no vagary, right? Yeah. Detail, yeah. So I'm going to, at the end, talk about a, a guy who wrote a book called Getting Things Done. His name is David Allen. David Allen talks about when he wrote that book, he'd been a you know, consultant, seminar presenter, facilitator for you know, decades at that point. And he wrote the book, and he, he was trying to get motivated to write the book, but struggling a little bit with the motivation and inspiration. So the first thing he did was he sat down and he wrote the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what he says is that he actually wrote the reviews in detail, like if they were written and who, what publication it was in and by whom, by whom, by what writer. And he says, very interesting, the reviews matched his vision pretty close. The actual reviews matched his vision pretty closely. Yeah, the publication might have been different or the author might have been different or something like that. But what it said about his book was, was almost spot on. Why? Because he knew exactly what to write in the book to get to that outcome, right? That's the power of vision. All right, your brain has a hard time letting go of a really good, uh, wild success kind of vision. You have to have a little bit of type A in you for that, but not as much as you might think. All right, the last thing that we're going to do, at least for now, and I'm going to dive deep into this, is the situational analysis piece. So this is the data collection piece, all right? And this is a lot more involved than most people realize um, and so, yeah. So this is a combination of both confronting the brutal reality, um, sorry, not yet, of both confronting the brutal reality and developing a whole lot of ideas about that, okay? So it's assessing the current situation both inside and outside. So confront, with the, confront the brutal reality. So we always have to start with the truth about how things actually are. And if we really don't start with the current reality, then no matter how bad or good that may be, then our plans are really just hopes and dreams. They're not based on anything, right? So the, the whole brutal reality thing comes from a concept called the Stockdale Paradox from the book Good to Great. Stockdale, Jim Stockdale was the highest ranking uh, US military official who was um, captured as a POW in the Vietnam War. And he was in the Hanoi Hilton um, concentration camp in that period, or prisoner camp, I guess. And um, he was there for many, many years. And he was asked by the author of Good to Great, well, well, who are the people who struggled and did not make it out of the camp, the POWs that didn't make it out of the camp? And Stockdale said, well, it was the optimists. And, and so the author of the book said, well, we, you know, you have to understand the rest of the conversation. But he said, well, you sound an optimistic. And Stockdale said, no, I was not optimistic. I was willing to confront the brutal reality that we were. He said the optimists were the people who thought, oh, we're going to get out at Christmas or we're going to get out at Easter or whatever. And then, you know, it would come and eventually they would just die of, of hopelessness, basically. They would just give up. And he said, you know, I was, I was completely unwavering my faith that I would find a way to prevail and turn it into the most dis distinctive moment of my life. But at the same time, I was not afraid to confront the reality that we were not going to get out at Christmas. And it was, it was that combination that birthed the Stockdale Paradox in the book Good to Great and in the research that Jim Collins and his team did. And the idea here is that you always have to combine the most brutal reality, no matter how good or bad it is, with an unwavering determination to find a way to prevail, despite whatever that may look like. So that's why confronting the brutal reality is so important. So there's sort of three components to this, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of dive uh, deep into them. So the first one is a, a pest analysis. So this is your sort of macro external environment analysis. And PEST is obviously an acronym since it's in caps, um, and we're looking at a larger external environment. So we're looking for patterns, we're looking for trends, we're looking for the immediate impact items and the anticipated impact items. And we're going to go through these four sort of components here. So you're going to look first at what's going on in the political regulatory environment that can have some impact on you. It can be positive or negative impact, okay? But what's going on in the political regulatory environment? So the P and PEST. Second one, what's going on in the economic, financial uh, environment that could have an effect on, on your business, right? Third one is what's going on in sort of the social, or a better way to think about this is sort of demographic or customer trends and patterns environment, okay? And then the last one is what's going on in the uh, technological environment. So what's going on with technology, with tools and resources that are available out there in the marketplace that could have some impact on your business. All of these things can have impacts that make it difficult to have forward growth, uh, that create opportunities for you, that make it easier for uh, competitors to enter the marketplace, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff here, right? 
um, to, to sort of unpack. Uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. So let's do, uh, let's, let's play real quick. Let's do a little pest analysis here. So take a second um, for the project that you're kind of working on. Um, actually, let's back up because I didn't really give you time on the previous. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes here. So, so let's do values, let's do vision. Okay, you don't have time to write a detailed review of your book to this morning or this afternoon, right? Well, you might this afternoon, but not right now. So let's do a little values, a little vision, and then let's catch up to pest. Just some, some quick bullets. This is back of the napkin type stuff, right? If you need help determining values, right? How do I make decisions? How do I implement my mission? What are the things that are, that are not okay to violate in the way I do business or do whatever in this project? Those are some questions to ask. Vision, remember wild success. And I'll give you just a couple of examples of things, you know, ignore me, tune me out if, if you're on a roll. If not, you know, check back in. Um, for the pest piece, for example, right? So um, take, for example, uh, the E and the S for just a moment and the combination of those two things, right? So what do we have going on economically at a global level right now? We have in inflation, right? Increasing prices of everything and, and sort of having to deal with, with the, the, the realities of the last couple of years. Okay, and I'm not gonna get into the politics of any of that because I don't wanna irritate anybody. All right, so, uh, but wh what happens there? Well, we have generally two categories of, of consumer products and services, right? Uh, you have sort of necessity, the necessity category and the luxury category, right? When the cost of things go up, what does that mean? It means that disposable income starts to decrease for people, right? You have a little bit of contraction in terms of consumer spending. When you have contraction of consumer spending, what tends to go? The luxury items. So understanding if you're a luxury good or service or a necessity good or service is a really important starting point, right? And so then what economic impacts are there on your business for that, right? And understanding how that ties into societal trends. Now, everybody's got different definitions of what a luxury good and a necessity good, you know, is for them. So you have to kind of understand your customer base to get a sense of whether or not they're really gonna compromise that much, right? And it's very interesting, I see a number of people, and this is great, I always encourage this in my classes too, number of people that are using these to take notes, right? Well, 10 years ago, uh, w was this a luxury good? Yeah, more so, especially this brand, right? Uh, today, it's a necessity good, right? I don't even, I don't have a home phone, right? Uh, my whole life is right here. Whatever file you need from me, it's here. Whatever email you need from me, it's here. Text message, phone call, photo, it's all here. Music, podcasts, books, it's all right here, right? This is not a luxury good to me anymore. And yet Ty under, doesn't understand why I don't keep it in a case. All right, all right, so we have pest analysis, okay? So political, economic, social, technological. All right, keep working, you can tune me out, but let's go on. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is the microanalysis or the industry level analysis, okay? And so we're gonna analyze our competitive industry uh, locally, of course, for sure, especially in a community like Southeast Texas, right? But certainly broader as well, uh, because there can be impacts from those things. And especially if that's something that's appropriate for your business. We're gonna use a tool uh, that is called Porter's Five Forces. Michael Porter uh, was a Harvard professor who invented probably the most important tool for sort of competitive industry analysis, and it's Porter's Five Forces of Competition, or on competition in the industry. 
Um, so Porter gives us five forces. Let me run through those here. So the first one is to just kind of get a baseline understanding of the state of current competition in the industry. Okay, baseline understanding of the state of current competition in the industry. So some questions that you might ask. Who are your current competitors? What is the lay of the land in terms of market share? Getting kind of an understanding of those kinds of things gives you some data. Okay? So, bless you. So are you the market leader of three? With 70% market share, that's a nice position to be in, right? Or are you uh, somewhere in the middle of the pack with, uh, you know, 300 and, uh, you know, everybody's got about 2 or 3%? That's a totally different thing, right? You can also look at this, are you part of a larger company, right? So are you sort of a semi-independent type person, part of a larger uh, company or organization? Well, how does that look? You have competitors of the parent company and then you have your competitors also. So that's another way to kind of look at that. So the lay of the land in, in terms of competition, current competition. Second of Porter's five forces, by the way the order is not necessarily that important but I find that this makes a little more logical sense to go in this order. So the second of Porter's five forces is the threat of new entrants. The threat of new entrants. Entrants like plural, entrant plural. Right? Not entrance, CE. Um, and the threat of new entrance, the question is very simple. How easy or difficult is it for another competitor to enter your industry and quickly gain significant market share? So we're talking entirely with threat of new entrance, not about current competitors, possible competitors, right? So what I always used to use when I talk about Porter's Five Forces and talk about threat of new entrance in class. Uh, in my you know, business classes is I used to always ask the question of Microsoft, right? It's a little bit different. You have to kind of go back maybe just five years or so with me, right? But before we got in this situation where Google Docs and slides and all those things were so free and easily accessible or where people were buying iPads and getting the Apple ones built in for free, right? So if you go back five years or so, what was the likelihood that some little startup from a garage was going to come in and take significant market share away in the office software product space from Microsoft? Very, very low, right? Right? I mean, 90 something percent of the, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I've got all Apple products and I still use Word, Excel, and PowerPoint because the compatibility is just, it's easier, right? Okay? So, so that's an example of where the, the, the barrier or the threat to new entrants is very low. Where are the places where it's very high, right? These are questions that you have to ask yourself. Third thing we want to look at as part of this Porter's Five Forces analysis, substitutes and complements. Okay? So these are other products or services out there that people could either substitute in place of yours or that could be strategic alignments for you because they complement yours or vice versa. Right? So what happens over time, right? You know, you have uh, uh, P&G and other companies like that, that that develop shampoo, right? And then they figure out that they need sort of a conditioner component to that. Well, now we have a complementary product, right? Uh, and so, you know, some other brand besides this or even one of the different models from Apple of this is a substitute product, right? Which is why Apple has different models. At least if you buy a substitute, you buy theirs and not somebody else's, okay? So substitutes and complementary products. Last two things are similar. The first one is the bargaining power of suppliers and the other one is the bargaining power of buyers. Okay? And the question here simply is in your relationship with any suppliers to your business or, your, or to yourself uh, and in your relationship with any customers, who has the bargaining power? Okay? So who controls that relationship, right? So if we stick with the Apple example for just a second, for years Apple has been producing processor chips themselves for these, right? And in the last two years, they've started, to sh started a major shift of producing the processor chips in their laptops and computers in-house also. Why? Because their entire product update schedule for their computer side of their business was entirely dependent on Intel and how fast Intel was producing new chips that allowed them to move something forward and the thermal architecture of that that had impacts on battery and casing and all that kind of stuff, right? And Apple said, you know what, forget you. Vertical integration, let's control the whole thing, right? And so now they make the chips themselves. Uh, so that's a supplier relationship. Easy to say, well, well, Intel has all the power. We're just at the mercy of them. Well, no. So Apple said, yeah, Intel has all the power and we're tired of that. We're going to do it ourselves, right? We'll figure it out, okay? And by the way, in bargaining power of buyers, no, the customer is not always right and no, the customer does not always control the relationship, okay? So be honest with yourself about who actually has control when. All right, so Porter's Five Forces. Lay of the land, current competition, threat of new entrants, substitutes and complements, bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of buyers. Okay?
Take a second. I'm sure you're seeing now why you're not going to develop a, an effective strategic plan in a one hour lunch and learn, right? You're, you're hard pressed to do it in a full day retreat for your team, right? Effectively. Okay. All right. The third component of our situational analysis is looking inside, the internal analysis. Okay. And there's two broad categories of things that we want to look at within our own companies. Uh, as part of this an internal analysis and those are resources and capabilities so let's let's take those apart so resources are things that you have right things that you have physical they're not always physical but things that you have okay so people right human resources financial resources money capital access to to those kinds of things equipment physical space location all those things right things that you have that are unique to you right Okay. And then on the capability side, you have things like any existing unique competitive advantages. So anything that you already do, capabilities are more like do, right? Resources are things you have, capabilities are things you do. Uh, so any, any existing competitive advantage that you have over uh, your competitors, uh, anything, information about your value proposition. A lot of uh, organizations with which I'm involved, both as a, a, an advisor and or a, a board member, where we have a lot of discussion about value proposition, right? What, why do people want to do business with this business? Okay? Um, unique processes and procedures. If you have unique ways of doing things, right? One of the things that for me is not necessarily a competitive advantage, but it's a capability, is that because I, I have studied and taught these things, in, in the more sort of traditional sense, I can then take the process and adapt it to customize the elements of it with particular clients, right? To whatever their needs are. Not everybody needs to go through this level of detail for all these things, but many people do and more than realize, right? Uh, so other things that you do that are unique. So resources and capabilities. So a second to think about your or assess your resources and capabilities. So the results of all this analysis, PEST, competitive industry, internal analysis, gives us another acronym. The business world loves acronyms, right? Uh, and it gives us our SWOT analysis. Okay, you've probably heard this before. It's, it's often the acronym most associated with strategic planning that people are most familiar with, right? And so SWOT is simply strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Our strengths and weaknesses are internal, okay? Uh, and so if you were to sort of codify this into some type of document where you said, okay, here's our SWOT analysis after doing all these things, right? Your strengths, you really want to, those are things that are internal, right? Resources and capabilities that you have, uh, that you do well, um, people, members of your team, right? Competitive advantage position, all those, all, market share, all that kind of stuff. That's internal type stuff, right? Uh, and the same thing on weaknesses, people that you need to fire, and we'll just leave it at that. Okay, all right. And then on, uh, on the opportunities and threats side, you have the external piece, right? And so ex opportunities are external sort of positive things in the marketplace that could allow you to get a competitive advantage or to gain more market share or something like that. Threats are things outside of the company that 
it could have a significant negative impact on the company that you want to pay attention to. Of course, if you live and work in Southeast Texas and you don't list tropical weather as a threat, you forgot a big one, right? Okay, because it's a threat to every business in this area, except, and he's not here, of course, but except maybe M&D Supply. <laughs> if Dyson, y'all you know, can take that back to Dyson for me, okay? All right, I always have to get my M&D uh, plug in there for, for Jeff Dyson. Okay, so strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So basically what you would do at this point is take the results of all this analysis and group it, right? Where does it go? It fits in one of these four categories. Right? And so that would be sort of the next step. <coughs> Not only that, and then we're going to set that aside, actually, right? We're going to set it aside for a second because we're, we're going to put that aside and we're going to come back to something else that's a high level thing, okay? And that is goals. Okay. Now, you're going to have to bear with me for just a second. I'm going to try to keep this, try to keep the level down just a little bit here, okay? But you're going to get a little mini Craig Escamilla rant here about goals, so forgive me. Okay, so I think we way overcomplicate goals, and I think that whoever perpetuated this big hoax on us all, that goals have to be SMART, you know, another acronym and all this stuff is, whoever that is, is a fraud, okay? And they should be called out as such. You don't measure a goal. You don't do a goal, okay? I, I don't understand that. Con you don't do a goal. You do an action. You do a strategy. You do enough of those, you achieve a goal. Okay? Yeah, take a football game, another sports analogy, right? A better one, right? Than golf. Okay, no, just kidding. I love golf. Okay, all right, so I actually love tennis the most. That's my favorite sport, and I've never played tennis. I just love it. All right, so, um, all right, so, so take football, right? What is the goal? The goal, I guess, ultimately is to win the game, right? But a, a sort of secondary goal to that, you know, in sort of each possession is to score a touchdown, right? Ideally. There's other ways that we can score, but ideally we want to score a touchdown, okay? So if, if our goal is to score a touchdown, we don't, do you score a touchdown? No. <laughs> you run a series of plays, right, that are each achieved at gaining more yardage, right, crossing, you know, getting a first down, getting closer to the, the end zone, and eventually you run a play that crosses into the end zone. So a series of actions leads you up to the point where all of a sudden a new state is true, and that new state that is true is that you have crossed into the end zone and thus scored a touchdown. See that? See the difference there? See how we overcomplicate this whole thing? So with that, definition in my, with that definition of a goal in mind, I would say that simply a goal is just a collection bucket. Okay? It's a collection bucket for what? For all the actions you need to do to make the state that that goal describes true. This is why I say we've overcomplicated goals, right? So if you look back at the SWOT summary, right? If you look back at your SWOT, once you group them all, right? Then go group them again. Go find all the things that look like each other, right? The actions or the things associated that could be actions associated with the stuff in the SWOT analysis. Group the ones that look like each other together. Write some short little aspirational statement that describes the common elements of that group and voila, you have a goal. And you'll probably have about three to five of those in a strategic plan that's a three to five year plan for a small to medium sized enterprise. I think if you have more than that, um, it's, it's probably a little too complex for what's necessary. Uh, and, um, and that's it. That's really all I have to say about goals. I think I kept that in fairly well in check. Okay. All right. So let's talk about strategies. So strategies are the actions. So basically now we're going to pick our SWOT analysis back up, our results of the SWOT analysis, and we're going to look at those things and we're going to say, okay, we want to do more with this strength. We want to correct or eliminate this weakness. We want to capitalize on this opportunity or match this strength to this opportunity. Uh, we want to do something to minimize the impact of or guard against these threats. Okay? And, and that's kind of the mindset that you go into each of those categories in. So if you go into each of those categories with that mindset, then basically what you're doing is taking all those results and saying, all right, these are the results. Do we want to take action on this? If we do, then what is that action, right? And outline the action. And that's a strategy. That's basically what it is, right? It's, it's taking the results of our analysis and saying, okay, what are the actions I'm going to take to change the condition to align that with goals, vision, and mission, right? Because there has to be alignment has to be vertical alignment. 
Um, so this is your measurable, actionable magic right here. Let's get a little academic for just a second and talk about uh, uh, these different levels of strategies. So most small businesses will start with what we call the business level of strategies. Okay, and the business level of strategy is is basically how you're going to compete, your how you're going to position your product or your service to compete, to be competitive. Okay. Uh, and so if you have multiple products and services, then you're probably going to have a strategy for each one of those, right? If you just have one, then you have a strategy for just that one. The good news is it's really pretty simple because there's really only two things you can do at the business level with a product or service. You can either make it cheaper, which doesn't mean sell it cheaper. It means reduce the production cost, right? Make it cheaper. Um, or you can make it different or better than whatever else is out there, which uh, is what we would call a differentiation strategy. So you have a low cost strategy or differentiation strategy, that's basically it. There's a third category that kind of blends them together that's like an imitation strategy, uh, which by the way is what they do uh, better than probably anybody else on earth. Actually, what they do is somebody else invents something and then they go find a way to try to make it better and charge more for it, right? And reduce their production costs, which is pretty impressive um, what they've managed to do as a small garage computer company. All right, so the business level strategy, you can make it cheaper or you can make it unique or better. Uh, so again, you're going you're gonna to have that for each product or service line that you have. Uh, if the business grows to a certain degree, then you might have multiple products and service lines and you got a lot of them going on and you have business strategies for all of them and you need to kind of unify the approach of all those different things. And that's when we would introduce what we call corporate level strategies. Because these are sort of strategies for the, the overall company as a whole, right? And, and I'm familiar with many businesses in this room where, I mean, you guys, right? You have corporate level strategies, of course, but then you have all kinds of business level strategies, right? Naturally. Same thing right here with Bill Clark Pest Control, right? And many, many others. Lamar University has this as well, right? You have to have strategies for the university as a whole, but then each unit has to have strategies and all that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, and so the corporate level strategies, there's a few things here. Um, kind of some evolution in this space, but I'll give you a couple of, of kind of the key ones. So if you only have one product or service line, or if it's really basically the same thing with slight variations, then your corporate level strategy is essentially single product or single service, right? Uh, and, and so you just want to make sure that there's unity in terms of producing that product or service from a corporate level. If you want to add some things that are sort of related to your core uh, products or services, you know, diversify but in some areas that are closely related, then we usually call that concentric diversification, right? Concentric circles, right, or circles built within one another. And so the whole idea is that you're just kind of expanding that circle by adding more circles around it, basically. Okay, so product and service line. So one of my clients, one of my, uh, you know, just absolute wonderful people that we all know and love in our community is, is the, the wonderful Broussard family with Broussard's Mortuary. Worked with them for a long time. And of course, many people may or may not realize that they have two events facilities in Southeast Texas and they have a barbecue restaurant, right? And funeral services that are 130 years old, right? This is actually, even though it may not look like it, is actually concentric diversification strategy, right? Because really what they've figured out is that they do an exceptional job with premium quality life events, which is what a funeral service done well is, right? So let's just expand and do the same thing with weddings and milestone birthday parties and lunch when you want some really good barbecue, okay? All right, so there's a great example of that. Uh, if you want to diversify products and services in ways that are unrelated, you say, hey, you know, I see a really cool idea over here and we have some uh, certain resources and capabilities that would allow us to do it, but it has nothing to do with anything that we already do. That would be what we can call conglomerate diversification. So this is where you see your big sort of corporations, P&G and those types of companies, right? That's a that's conglomerate diversification level strategy for the whole corporation, okay? Uh, and then there's one more that I've kind of touched on a little bit already briefly, which is vertical integration. And this is when you bring sort of the supply, supply and distribution chains in-house. Um, and usually that's aimed at reducing the production costs, um, but usually we don't decrease the prices. So in other words, we drive our margins up by taking more control of the entire production process. That's a great strategy. And, uh, and actually, surprisingly, or maybe not, but you may not realize that a lot of small businesses actually can take on a vertical integration strategy that can be really, 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 really effective for them, right? Uh, so that's a great, great opportunity. Um, there are others, those are the big ones. Uh, if you're a small business with a few hundred uh, thousand or a couple million in revenue, you probably don't have to worry about corporate strategies at this point, um, but you will eventually if you grow. 
uh, because otherwise your people won't be rowing in the same direction. And I could give you a list of clients that I'd love to work with in Southeast Texas that are not as big as you might think that, that could really benefit from some corporate level strategies. And if you want to know who they are, you can come see me afterwards. And you can, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, just kidding. This is not a Craig promotion thing. All right, so what next? So the next thing again that you want to do is go back to your SWOT analysis results, decide which ones are actionable, and then which ones you want to do something about. Just because they're actionable doesn't mean you want to act on them right now, okay? And that's okay too. And again, that's how you create strategies. Um, okay. So now what do you have? You have a mission or a purpose. You have your values or principles of the way you operate. You have a vision, hopefully, determined, uh, hopefully uh, defined in terms of wild success with crystal clarity. You have goals or collection buckets, and you have a bunch of strategies. That's 80% of a strategic plan right there, right? So the next thing we want to do is add the implementation plan. Implementing strategies is easy. Um, there's really just two things that you need to do. You need to define the responsible parties. Responsible party does not mean somebody who has to do it all by themselves, right? If you're in a larger organization, it might be a team, but who is the point person for seeing this through to completion, for providing updates on it, and so on and so forth, okay? Hopefully proactive communication in that respect, ideally, okay? Uh, and then the other thing you want to define, of course, always is what is the deadline or when is the deadline? When does this need to be completed or when do we need status reports or progress reports or those kinds of things? Depends on how big and far reaching uh, the, the strategy is. I usually suggest to clients that they divide their strategies into immediate priorities versus future initiatives. Um, I like to define immediate by about the next 18 months. That's very arbitrary. Okay. Um, but I find that that's a good time period. Once you get halfway through sort of the second year, it's a good time to evaluate some of those future initiatives and see if you're ready to do something on those things. Um, this also allows you to sort of make sure that you have time to course correct before you get going too far down a pointless path. If you're the owner and you have people that work for you or if you're the top executive, um, I think that your job in implementation is to oversee, integrate, and make sure progress stays on track. I think many executives and owners try to assign responsibility to everything, for everything to themselves, and that's a recipe for disaster. This is very rare that the owner is the person actually responsible for the doing, and if they are, they're either a solopreneur, which is great and ideal, or they need to get out of the operation of their business because they're probably causing a lot more problems than they think. I've, this is not my first rodeo, okay? All right. The last step is evaluation, and this is just performance measures. So how are we gonna make sure that we accomplish what we set out to achieve? That's the question that we're answering here. How are we gonna make sure that we set out, that we accomplish what we set out to achieve? What data is gonna tell you if you're on track and if you're crossing into the end zone, basically, okay? So a couple of things to add here, establish some key performance indicators, measures of on track, Measures of success and completion. That's what a key performance indicator is. Key performance indicator should be lead measures. Another great Jeff Dyson uh, idea that's not his, but that I'll give him credit for, um, is lead measures, right? Lead measures versus lag measures. So uh, if you want to lose weight, this is the best analogy for this, right? If you want to lose weight, what, what do most of us do when we want to lose weight to, to figure out if we're on track? We get on the scale, right? Is that a lead measure? Does getting on the scale, does the act of standing on the scale do anything other than depress or excite you uh, toward weight loss? No. It's a lag measure. It happens after the fact. So tracking the number of calories that you consume, the number of calories that you burn, and all those kinds of things, those are lead measures that tell you whether or not you're moving in the right general direction, right? And of course, there's you know, psycho people out there that track mac macros and all that stuff. And if you're in here, I didn't mean to insult you with that. Okay. Um, all right, good. My problem is that I, I know I'm consuming more calories than I'm burning. <laughs> I'm not doing anything about it other than getting on the scale and crying. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm probably in good company though. Uh, so the other thing you want to do is make sure that you have both quantitative and qualitative measures. Okay, Improved condition, meaning a qualitative measure, improved condition is just as important as financial success. I have a lot of clients who very kindly say that uh, they couldn't quantify what my impact on the bottom line of working with them is, but they wouldn't have done some of the stuff that they got to do 
had we not improved their condition in terms of their clarity and ability to focus on those things. It's a nice compliment, and I don't say it to brag, I say it to emphasize the importance of improved condition. All right? Qualitative is, is just as important. It's not the only one, but don't be only a numbers person. Okay? Unless you're an accounting firm. All right. Course correct when needed. If a key performance indicator shows you that something is off track, don't wait until it fails to say, I knew it would fail because it was off track. <laughs> Do something about it, right? I wish these things, these jokes weren't based on reality. I really <laughs> wish they weren't. <laughs> All right. Don't be afraid to abandon a good plan. Oh, sorry, I wasn't ready to go on yet. All right, don't be afraid to abandon a good plan if it isn't working. Um, and don't be afraid to abandon a good plan if a better opportunity comes along. So I want to kind of reiterate that thing, right? A strategic plan, its, its greatest value is in its providing decision criteria. This is, remember I said we want luck, but we want to take advantage of it earlier? That's exactly what I mean. If you don't know what you're committed to, then you just have to say yes to everything or no to everything, right? If you know what your commitments are and what your strategic direction is, new opportunity shows up, you can look at that and go, yes, that, that, is, that is a good lucky break for us. Let's jump on it. Or one shows up and you go, no, doesn't fit with where we're going, right? Doesn't fit with where we're going. And that's okay. By the way, the same thing is true for you personally with your to-do lists and your calendars also, right? If your inventory of commitments that you personally have made is not up to date, current, complete, clear, accurate, if your calendar is not, and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you want to go to lunch? You don't know. You can go to lunch. You might be stressed out the whole time thinking of all the crap you should be back doing, right? Okay. Big improvement opportunity. Okay, so let's tie this together. Um, so this planning model, this strategic planning model that I've given you, uh, is the exact process that the greatest planner on earth goes through every single time it plans anything. So who do you think the greatest planner on earth is? It's a trick question. It is you. And it's you, and it's you, and it's everybody in here, right? Yes, you did. Well done. I don't have anything to give you. There's some extra lunches back there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, the greatest planner on earth is actually the human brain, right? Why? Everybody in this room is constantly planning all kinds of stuff. Guess what you're planning? Even stuff like when the alarm goes off, hmm, do I hit the snooze? How much longer can I lay here? When's that first meeting? Who cares? Do people know how to find? What am I going to wear today, right? That's a planning thing, right? What am I going to eat for breakfast? Should I eat lunch before or after I listen to this jerk? Right? Those are the kinds of things, right? <laughs> Let me save the cookie so if he's boring, I can preoccupy myself for a little while, right? So, David Allen, I mentioned him earlier, right? David Allen figured this out, and he calls it the natural planning model because it's the model that your brain will use to plan anything. And look at this model that he came up with in his book, Getting Things Done, that was published in 2000 or 2001, and I'm sure he figured it out before that. Look at this model. It starts with purpose and principles. Hey, that sounds a lot like mission and values, right? And then it goes on to vision. That sounds a lot like vision, right? <laughs> then it goes on to brainstorm, which is basically just generating a bunch of ideas. Well, how could you generate a bunch of ideas? Well, you collect data, which means you do analysis, right? Then you have to figure out what to do with all that data that you generated. So you have to organize it. You have to eliminate some stuff that doesn't make sense. You have to put it into some format that, makes, that does make sense to group things that are alike and decide how to take action on them. And then you get to work. Next action. You do this every day, right? What am I going to wear? Well, okay. Let's start with a couple of things. What is my purpose and principle? Okay, well, what do I have to do today? Do I have to see any people? Hmm, no. All right. Well, then I can wear something a little more casual than normal, right? All right. What are my purpose and um, what are my principles associated with that? You know, some, it's a good one. Food is a good one for this, right? So, you know, why do people want to eat? Because they're hungry, right? Is usually, or, but, but there's other things, right? Business deals, you know, an opportunity for socialization, romance, stuff like that are purposes for eating, right? Principles. Most people in this room, I'm assuming, will not pick roadkill up off the side of the road and decide to eat that, right? I don't know. Did anybody go to A&M? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so principles then become a guide for what we'll do, right? Vision. Well, what would I like? Well, it'd be really nice to kind of have a relaxed dinner, maybe in a nice place, a little dress up a little bit more, right? Maybe some Italian food, or maybe some Mexican food, something like that, right? Okay, all right, and then we come up with ideas. Well, okay, if we want to go Italian, then there's this, 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 and these options. So well, how much time do we have? Maybe we could drive over to Houston. There's a couple of really great Italian restaurants over there, right? Uh, and then we organize our ideas, right? And then we, you know, get in the car and go somewhere, right? Call and make a reservation, right? Okay, so this is how we do pretty much everything that we do. It's really that simple. It's radical common sense. I do love that. Everybody in the room knows how to do radical common sense kind of stuff. And that's how easy making a strategic plan is too. It's also how important it is. We're literally wired to make plans. Okay. All right, so before I wrap up, do you have any questions for me? All right, now I'll hang around for a second in case you have some more specific or unique to you questions. And some, yes, sir. What about the person that is running a business all by themselves? It's just starting. Okay. And basically, it's just them. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything well, change? Uh, what else they need to look at? No, I don't think so. I wouldn't start any place different. I can tell you this is the process that I went through when I launched my business, sat down, clarified all this stuff. I can tell you that a mini version of this process, what I went through January, whatever the first Friday in January was, at Rayo's on Dallin all day long. Sat there all day long. Outlined all kinds of goals for the year, tweaked all kinds of things that I learned from the first couple of years in business by myself full time. All right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great process. It's not my process. All right? Good. Good question. It's a process that we should go through, though. I will say that. If you're just starting out and it's just you, I'd go through the process. <laughs> All right, so we talked about what is a strategy. We talked about what is strategic planning. Talked about the strategic planning process and the components thereof. Stick with David Allen. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. So a strategic plan is important because it focuses the work on the most likely actions that will achieve the goals we care about, that will make our vision a reality, that will allow us to fulfill our mission. That's it. That's what it's all about. If you want to find me, if you want more random thoughts that come into my head that I might put out on social media every once in a while, or stupid pictures of stuff, my cats, um, this is places that you can find me. You haven't seen my cats? Oh, sorry. <laughs> They're there. All right, it was a pleasure. I, I, I want to say that it was a real honor to, to kick off the series. I want to tie this together with a piece of strategic planning also. I had the great pleasure of facilitating, as a board member, the um, retreat for the Beaumont Chambers board back in the fall where we really kind of defined a new strategic direction for the chamber. We changed our whole organizational structure to, to match a whole new strategic direction. And one of the things that we outlined was, hey, we collected some data last spring about what people wanted to learn more about to, to move their businesses and our business community forward. And this, amongst the other things that Paul mentioned earlier uh, before we started, uh, was one of those things. And so I'm really honored to have helped kick this series off and to have talked about this. Hopefully you can tell I love this stuff, but I think it's really, really important too. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Uh, I'll hang around, as I said, and uh, you know, have a great afternoon and a good weekend. One of the biggest things we hear is people say that they can't find good employees. Okay, you know, we just can't find them, they're not out there. Believe me, they're out there. But those people that are out there now, the younger people, they want to work at a place where they feel like they mean something and they feel like the work means something. That is a company that has a strategic plan. And, and a lot of them, you know, they're, they're not really sure what they want to do, they know what their parents did. But they don't want to do that. And they don't want to do that because they spent the first 18 years of their life listening to their parents bitch about their job. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're running away from that. And they want to do something different. They want to go someplace where they feel like there really is a vision and it's not just a plaque on a wall. And that's the company that actually does the long range plan and strategic planning. It doesn't matter if you're in it by yourself or you got, there's two of you. 
and you're going out to get that first tire, or Josh, how many employees you got? Seventy. Or you got seventy employees, and you're trying to put on number seventy-one. It doesn't matter. If you want to get them and you want to keep them, do what Craig says. Thank you. Have that, and then stick with it. Actually, do it, and let everybody that works there know what is what you're trying to do. Right. And they feel like they're a part of it. People will work for less money if they feel like they're really a part of something. And if you're a brand new business, that may be what you're doing. <laughs> you can't help. Okay? So please take that to heart. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. I learned it all from him.